So good morning, uh, good evening, good day, uh, wherever you are. Uh, this is uh, Goal 16 by Guy Christian Agbo. Today, I uh, have the honor uh, to, uh, to have a very important guest, uh, Mr. Tutu Alicante. Uh, Mr. Tutu Alicante is going to introduce himself. What I know is, I mean, he has a, a, a huge biography, but I will let him introduce himself. Uh, so, Brother Tutu, how are you? I am doing great, Christian, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And for your audience, those that do not know me, yeah. my name is, as you just mentioned, Tutu. Mm -hmm. I am from Equatorial Guinea. I am a human rights and anti-corruption lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the U.S. Uh, for too long now. Right. Uh, among other reasons, because of the work that I do. And because right. of the work that I do, I cannot go back to Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. But I've had the pleasure of uh, launching an organization, EG Justice, that focuses on uh, human rights, uh, promoting transparency or fighting corruption, and promoting the rule of law in Equatorial Guinea. And that's what I do. I live in uh, North Carolina, where I have two kids and my wife, and that's what I do. Congratulations, brother. Uh, just in the interest of transparency, I uh, have uh, known Mr. Tutu for a long time for various reasons. Uh, because I used to uh, be the counsel, uh, the legal counsel or legal advisor, you call it that way, for Equatorial Guinea at the permanent mission here in New York and uh, the embassy of Equatorial Guinea in Washington. So uh, in that spirit, uh, I have to disclose to the audience that I have worked uh, for the government of Equatorial Guinea, not as an employee of the government, but <laughs> as a legal advisor. So those are two different things. So. I've traveled a lot to Equatorial Guinea. I've met President Obiangema. I've met uh, Mange uh, Theodorin, Lima Gabriel, all the folks that are interested uh, uh, in, in the government of, of Equatorial Guinea. Today's subject is going to be about kleptocracy. Uh, Mr. Tutu wrote a very nice piece. I'm going to put the link uh, on my YouTube page for those who want to uh, dig deeper or dive deeper into it because it's a long piece. Mm -hmm. We cannot talk about the entire piece during the, uh, the podcast, but we are going to try to address uh, specific issues about um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this kleptocracy. So, um, Mr. Tutu, why kleptocracy? So before, before I dive into your question, Christian, I hope right. you would uh, one day take the time to explain to your audience why is it that you work for a kleptocracy or yes. for kleptocrats. Yes. I know you just mentioned that you are not an employee, yes. but still, you know, I think one of the problems that I hope we get into today yes. is the problem of enablers. Right. Right. Theodorin, uh, Obiang, Sasso uh, cannot come to the U.S and do the accounting and do the lawyering and do the, uh, all the work that has to be done in order for the properties to end mm -hmm. up in banks here. Mm -hmm. So there are always people, um, they do that work for them. Right. And is it, 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 it still astounds me that uh, still today, there aren't enough laws to ensure that you know, people that facilitate, people that enable the kleptocrats uh, are not held to account. I'm not, I'm not by any way suggesting that you're an enabler of kleptocracy. I do want, however, you know, for all of us as Africans to know what role do we play, right? Of Even those that work for them inside Equatorial Guinea, there are people that work for Theodorin you know, for Obian and these people, mm -hmm. you know, we have to explain, okay, how do these people get their money out here? And it's because there are many people surrounding. Mm -hmm. But again, that's in the conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. Just so I put you on the hot spot. My no, friend. definitely. Why uh, hey. <laughs> I, 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 I like that because you see, th this is what people have to, some people really understand the context. <laughs> I have not worked personally for neither Obiang himself, mm -hmm. neither for Theodorin, neither for Lima, neither for any of the Obiang. But I have worked for the government exactly. of Equatorial Guinea, helping them here in the U.S. as a permanent mission, as I've done for other African countries. I've worked mm -hmm. for many African countries here in the U.S. Uh, some of them are kleptocracy regime, mm -hmm. but the relationship that they have here in the U.S. is through the U.N. They have work, legal work that I do for them. But he, I, he, hey, trust me, I'm there with you. 
enablers <laughs> are the most, I mean, the most outrageous people that I've never met. You will see that in my book. Yeah. I have a book that's coming out. It's called Fixing the Fixers. That's the exactly. title of my book. Exactly. So exactly. It, the title itself, it's outrageous. What I'm going to write about those who are participating in this kleptocracy, those who are facilitating, those who are the conductor, the mm -hmm. conductors of this kleptocracy is going to be fascinating to read. But mm -hmm. uh, hey, I appreciate you bringing <laughs> that up so people know. But <laughs> I'm not a kleptocracy or a kleptocracy <laughs> neighbor. <laughs> so, I know, I know, record, I know. Just for the no. <laughs> Only because we are friends, I know I can oh, put you in that house. De no, definitely, no brother, definitely. No, but so yeah. I am very glad we are talking about kleptocracy. And your question yeah. to me, you know, why kleptocracy, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I say I'm glad because we have to make the distinction between kleptocracy and corruption. Right. Right. Yeah. There's corruption everywhere, but what we are talking about here is something that rises above, way above mm -hmm. and beyond with the common day corruption, even corruption by uh, leaders. You know, right. we might get into whether there is kleptocracy or not in the U.S. One mm -hmm. thing that you know, I can right away tell you right now that I don't believe there is. Why kleptocracy? Well, when I think about kleptocracy, mm -hmm. there are two fundamental concepts you know, that I'm also linking i'm also thinking about right one mm -hmm. of them you know is the whole concept of complete state capture right right so here you have either one person or uh, one family often mm -hmm. or one individual with a clique of people a group of people uh, who completely take over all the functions of the state right where the sole purpose of amassing as much wealth that should belong to the state mm -hmm. for themselves. So it's mm -hmm. self-enrichment by people that completely take over the state, right. which is exactly what's happening in Equatorial Guinea where there isn't any functioning institutions, right? You don't mm -hmm. have a parliament that works, you don't have a judiciary that works, you don't even have a military that works, you don't have anything but Obiang, Obiang's family and the clique, the, the loyal people around Obiang, mm -hmm. right? And I would venture to say that, you know, it's the same thing that is happening in Cameroon with Paul mm -hmm. Biya, the same thing that's happening in Congo Brazzaville with the mm -hmm. Sasso family, the same thing that's happening under the Biya family, uh, Bongo and now, I mean, uh, Ali and now uh, his son. His son, yes. I mean, Omar and now Ali. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing that's happened in Chad with uh, uh, Mr. Idris, uh, uh, Idris Deby, right? Mm -hmm. um, Central African Republic is a more complex situation. But in those places, what do you have? People that have been there forever, you know, president that have been there for decades. They have completely usurped all the functions of the state. Mm -hmm. And they're using all that power, all that usurpation, all that monopoly to enrich themselves, primarily themselves and their family. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, it is the gravest, the, the, the biggest danger that we have in Central Africa, most definitely in Equatorial Guinea. Mm -hmm. When you have, instead of a state, one family that is there for self-enrichment, you cannot have democracy. You yeah. cannot have a respect of human rights. You cannot have strong state institutions. So you cannot have anything that allows for there to be a state. Mm -hmm. So I say... I think about kleptocracy with two terms. One is complete state capture. The other one is failure of a state, mm -hmm. right? So when you have a situation where Obiang and his family have completely overtaken all the functions of the state, then you have a non-state. You have failure of a state. You have what we have, a failed state in Equatorial Guinea. A yeah. state that is unable, for instance, to respond to the current uh, uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 yeah. pandemic, yeah. right? So. I'm sorry to expand myself to talk too much over here. No, you don't no, have definitely, to definitely. No, I know we're limited in time, but yeah, yes. You know, so um, l l let me ask you this. Let's let's try to to go a, a little, uh, be a little more concrete because we know what mm -hmm. the scientific definition of kleptocracy is, or what a kleptocrat should look like. But in in terms of you know uh, going down on the ground, let's say I'm a businessman, I want to invest in Equatorial Guinea. How is that going to work for me? Yeah. So you go to Equatorial Guinea today, right now. Yes. And you have the money to invest, mm -hmm. which is not what happened to most people. But right. say you go and you have the money to invest. The first thing you have to do, you have to find a very powerful government official okay. that is basically going to be your godfather inside that system. Mm -hmm. right? 
that person is going to demand some bribes. Right. Right. The next person they're supposed to fill out all the paperwork is going to demand bribes. Right. Your godfather is going to put you in touch with a lawyer mm -hmm. who, with whom he has already worked, right. who is going to demand bribes. So right. at the end of the day, before you know it, 80% uh, of your money has disappeared already and you still do not have the permit to operate. To operate right? yeah. At that point, what happens? Often, the same godfather or somebody even more powerful comes along and say, look, um, I know you came here to sell tractors, mm -hmm. but instead, we can get into this business of transporting arms, trafficking mm -hmm. arms or doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, we can get money from the state and work for the Ministry of Defense. I can mm -hmm. get money from the state and what normally costs a million, we can say cost $10 million and we can be in business, right? right? And that might go along for four or five years. Eventually, that person is going to get rid of you mm -hmm. and you who went over there with the knowledge, with some funding to begin with, uh, with all the contacts in the West, etc., you'll be left out of the business. Mm -hmm. I, either trying to sue them or just completely out of luck. That is Equatorial Guinea in a nutshell. Yeah. Now, in terms of land acquisition, land acquisition, how does that work mm -hmm. today? I mean, I've heard stories where people say, you know, the land, for example, when you arrive at the airport in Malabo, you land that boulevard that goes, that takes you from the airport to, um, to the downtown. Mm -hmm. I heard that all the land left and right of the road belong to the Obian family, you know? Is, it, is, 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 is that true? So what happened in Equatorial Guinea is that, as, as, as you might already know, you, you mm -hmm. already know this, mm -hmm. uh, Equatorial Guinea was under 200 years under Spanish colonization. Right. right? It was Spanish, Spanish colony. During those 200 years, mm -hmm. Spain used Equatorial Guinea primarily for the purpose of uh, producing and exporting coffee, cocoa, and timber. Yeah. The Spanish people that were there own, you know, appropriated, misappropriated most of the land in Equatorial Guinea, Guinea okay. for the purpose of producing their cocoa, the coffee, yeah. and the timber that then they exported to Spain and other places, right? In 1979, then, uh, well, in 1968, first, uh, Macias takes over. Mm -hmm. Macias does not, uh, Macias was Obiang's uncle, his predecessor, right, for those right, that right. don't know the history. Uh, he does not necessarily appropriate all the land for himself or for anyone. He just says, okay, these lands will be here. The ones that are necessary for the state will be used for state purposes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Obian comes along in 1979 and decides, oh, uh, Theodorin, you can keep this land. Armengol, who is another brother, you yeah, can keep this land. Of his, yeah. Theodoro Biogo, who is uh, Constantine, brother -in -law. his brother, yeah. you can keep this land and distribute all this land, which exactly... All the land, they went from colonial hands. They should have gone to the state under Macias. Now Obiang uh, took them and distributed them among the lawyer people that he had around him mm -hmm. and family members, right. right? So it is unfortunately true what you have heard that yes, a lot of the, all of the land basically on that boulevard has now been um, expropriated by uh, Obiang and family members, you know, for their own mm -hmm. benefit and now they use it. And in fact, the palaces, uh, there are several palaces on that road, mm -hmm. and al along the way on both sides, mm -hmm. um, Obian and Theodorin and Constancia have constructed, and I mean, yes, unfortunately, it's the reality. I also heard that Exxon Mobil located somewhere there on that road, because I've seen them, I've seen that location. They have been complaining that they want to leave the location because they cannot purchase that property, they can only rent it. I mean, how does, the, how, how, how does that work? Because there are other places around the city of Malabo yeah. or elsewhere in the Equatorial Guinea where, <laughs> uh, you know, foreign companies buy the land. Yes. But, you know, I, I don't understand that. And it's the case of uh, Marathon, for instance, you know, which right. has land in Punta Europa. Yes. I think what happened, what happened with Exxon, you know, is that from the beginning, they got into a bad deal, right? You know, the right. land that uh, uh, Exxon is renting belongs to none other than Obiang, his son, Theodorin, and Constancia, through a company mm -hmm. called Abayak. Abayak, yes, fact, I heard about that company a lot. 
in fact, exactly. In fact, that whole neighborhood, that whole complex itself is called, well, people know it as a Bayakone because when it was being constructed, the construction, com the, the placards and everything, you know, said a Bayak. So Abayak. people just call okay. that whole area a Bayak. But in any event, uh, because it was rented from the president and his wife and his mm -hmm. son, right now uh, ExxonMobil found themselves in a uh, dead end, you know, where mm -hmm. they cannot, unfortunately, you know, for them, they cannot leave that contract. But, you know, that's, that's again, you know, very, um, that, that's symptomatic, or that's a good example of how a quarterly dinner works, where depending on who you embed with, you might not be able to leave that contract. Right. right, and that's that's the that's the situation there. Right now, in in terms of banking, uh, because which is uh, you know you control the land, you control the banking. How does the banking sector works? Because I mean I heard and I've checked a lot of stories about uh, the banking. So how 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 does that work there? Yeah. You know, under this kleptocratic regime. Yeah. So I I want to hope that you know things have gotten better, and I want mm -hmm. to hope that primarily you know because. Uh, right now, we know about uh, a loan that the IMF is, uh, right. well, has already actually uh, signed Approved, and uh, yeah. the first batch has already gone out, you know, so mm -hmm. it's no longer in a discussion, you know, it's already approved and made. Right. So I want to hope that, I mean, part of the, part of the, uh, uh, many of the benchmarks on right. that loan have to do with structural reforms affecting the bank, uh, in, impacting the banks, etc. So I want to hope that mm -hmm. you know, things have worked. Right. My experience when I was in Equatorial Guinea was that, first of all, when I was in Equatorial Guinea, there was only one bank. Yeah. But still, most recently, you know, the banks that have been there are banks in which pre uh, powerful people, the same people that we're talking about, Obiang mm -hmm. and his son and others, are major shareholders in those banks. You know, so yeah. you have... Wow. Yeah. So yeah. you have a French bank. Uh, you have... Uh, a Cameroonian <laughs> bank, they will yeah. come and they have to get a local partner, you know, a local partner who might become Theodorine or who might be Theodore Biogo or Bian himself. And they, uh, through that relationship, you know, they begin to control what companies, you know, get funding, what companies do not, um, what type of interest they demand from depending on who you are, who can open bank account and who cannot, you know, mm -hmm. members of the opposition, for instance, mm -hmm. political opposition, uh, have a hard time, you know, getting any credit, getting any loan from these banks, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it operates, again, two things that people have to keep in mind, you know, and I don't have to tell you this because you already yes. know, you know, it's yeah. the whole thing of complete state capture by these powerful people, yep. right? And the fact that, you know, this is a failed state, a state in which, yes, you might have all the veneer, all the, all the paraphernalia that the state should have, banks, parliament, etc., but nothing works because everything is beholden to those people that have captured the state. Mm -hmm. Now, just in the context of what you're saying, for the audience to understand uh, the extent of how, uh, um, how much capture uh, this the Obiang have in, you know, within Equatorial Guinea and um, on Equatorial Guinea uh, uh, economy. Um, my understanding is that uh, Societe General, every bank, each of the bank, Societe General, uh, BGFI, um, um, the Cameroonian bank called First, yeah, Cameroonian, First Afrilan yeah. something. First Afrilan something. Afrilan, yeah. So I know that Obiang, because I've seen the document, Obiang has 20% of each of those banks. And the government of Equatorial Guinea only get 20%. The rest of the 30% are distributed among the family members, you know? So I just want the audience to understand that that's what you are referring to as yeah. a state, uh, state, state, state capture. Now, yeah, I mean, I mean, I wish I, wish I had known that you'd be interested in this because there, I have a page actually yeah. that tells you, you know, how much percentage of Biang owns in Societe General. Mm -hmm. Then there is his wife, then there is Theodorine, then there is mm -hmm. the other son, Justo and Pastor. Then, I mean, it goes through and it tells you how much they own, and it's the same exact people. You know? So it's a complete state capture, which I, I, as I mentioned, you already know. For your audience yeah. to understand, I think, you know, I'll be happy to share documents that, you know, no, you can, definitely. That's yeah, something but, that we need to work on because for the mm -hmm. purposes of what we're doing, yes, we are, you know, sensitizing where we are, you know, we, 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 we're trying to make people, we, we, we take, we, we're taking the awareness to a notch, means to a higher level where people can understand that we also are concerned about what is going on in Africa. It's, it's, it's not 
just supposed to be, uh, you know, um, our Caucasian friends or, our, you know, other people from the West. We are from the West and we are from there. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to be on the front line uh, to, to fight this. So uh, besides what we do right now, we also fight that uh, with the Department of Justice and with the FBI mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this is precisely one of the documents that may be utilized for an FCP evaluation, given that Societe Generale is not disclosing that they mm -hmm. are paying this money to the Obian, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. we have to look into the transfers that have been done by the Obian all these years transfer from Societe Generale or from the other bank account because the proceed that Abayak is getting or that Obiang is getting from all these deals are all, they fall under every single money laundry laws in every exactly. other country except the Quattro So exactly. there is room for a lot of investigation, a lot of sanctions and punishment as well. So um, having said that, we can, uh, uh, I haven't talked about the banking, we'll talk about the land. Um, let's really talk about the, the institutions themselves. Mm -hmm. the, 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 yes, the, 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 the institution of, of, a, of a kleptocratic regime. How, that, mm -hmm. how, how do these institutions operate? Yeah. So before before we talk about the institutions, right. uh, one thing I wanted to mention, you know, for mm -hmm. your audience, mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand the whole concept of state capture and what I was trying to describe earlier, right. uh, um, and I think we might be able to get into this. There might be time for us to talk right. about the tethering case in the U.S. Right. But when you look at that case, and as you mentioned at the beginning, I wrote about this in a in a paper recently, which right. you know, you hopefully you share the link. Right. Um, you look at how money ended up in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, and it's clear that Theodorin was not often, he was not even bothering going to the bank and saying, how much money do I have in account sending here? He was just calling his cousin at the Ministry of Finance, and this is the daughter of Armin Gold, this brother of the president, right. and right. saying, I need you to wire X amount to my uh, lawyer in California, right? So you have you have both where he will go to the bank and there he had Somagi Forestal, uh, this uh, uh, yeah. forestry company. Yeah, for, forestry and company. Yeah. Through that account and through a local construction, a company that he owned, a construction company that he is fictitious company that he owned with an Italian guy Roberto Berardi, and he would wire. Isn't that the guy that he end up locking up? Yes, yes, exactly. But you know, he will wire millions and millions through this bank account, but also go to Treasury and tell the um, minister over there, who was his cousin, you know, I need to wire 25 million to my lawyer. I mean, so it's, it's a complete, you know, we own this state and we can do with it whatever we want. You know, that, that, that's the situation. But again, your question about institutions, that, mm -hmm. that is, that's precisely the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of state institutions generally, you have the judiciary, you know, which the judiciary and the legislative branches, you know, which should be on par, on equilibrium with the executive branch. They're completely beholden to the executive, right? Obian, yeah. as president, is also the first magistrate of the nation. Mm -hmm. And what that technically means in Equatorial Guinea is that he gets to decide, you know, who can be the president of the Supreme Court, the president of the uh, um, uh, Constitutional Court, who can get to be the judges under this president? He can then fire at his own wish, at his own whim, without any discussions with the president of the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court, or without any discussions, certainly with right. Senate or, par or Parliament, right? And when you get to Parliament, it's the same exact thing that, you know, yes, you, it appears that they have elections and people are running, but before people run, Obian has already decided, oh, this person is going to go to this uh, parliamentary seat. This person is going to hold this senatorial seat. And in fact, there are situations in which you go through the elections, there is a slate, people are elected or supposedly elected. Mm -hmm. And then the next week, Constantia, somebody comes along, Constantia is the wife of the president, comes yes. along and decides, no, instead of this person, it's going to be this person. You know, and yeah. completely, I mean, it's, it's a complete... By the way, uh, by the way, you... That, that's the question that I was like, I'm going to ask you right now is how many presidents does the Quattro Guinea have? How many currently. presidents? Yes, currently. 
How many president uh, as in head of state? Yeah, like head of state, because what I heard is that Equatorial mm -hmm. Guinea has four presidents. <laughs> President Teodoro <laughs> Biangema himself. As he was. <laughs> right? Uh, Constancia Mange, uh, uh, she's the oh, president yeah. too. Yeah. And then uh, Theodorine is the president because he's vice president of Anime. He yeah. acts like the president. He can lock you up. He can lock, he locked his brother last time, uh, Gabriel. Yes, yes. yes. Who is yes. the minister of uh, this of uh, oil. And then you have uh, uh, Biogo, who is the yes. brother-in-law, who also yes. acts like he's the president. So, yes. I mean, I just wanted people to understand how many... Yeah. But, but let me ask you, before you answer that, <laughs> before you answer that, uh, how many children, how many children of Obiang are part of the government? Yes. So, I mean, I think, again, you, I have to go back to what I said at the beginning, yeah. right? You have sure. to think of state capture and failed state. Failed state. Right. And when you have a failed state, head of state is just a figurehead. Mm -hmm. uh, who really rules power depends on many, many things. So, for instance, when Obiang is ill, and Obiang has been ill for, for a long time, mm -hmm. but for instance, right now, so since February, Obiang has been in his village in Mongomo, mm -hmm. who is calling the shots, Theodorine and his mother, right? Uh, so, there are many factors under which Theodorine becomes the most powerful, per, powerful person in, in, on the land, or his mother is often the most powerful pe person. Often, Theodoro Biogo, who is now chief of protocol for the president, becomes the most powerful person because Theodorine is in Brazil partying and Obiang is too sick to make decisions. So, there, in fact, power resides uh, at different places at different points, right? Or being how many of his kids are in a position of power, I cannot think of any um, kid, any of the for Biang's kids, that does not have a power that they hold, a position that they hold illegitimately, mm -hmm. right? And often it's not ministers, because ministers we know Gabriel is there and Theodoro, Theodorin, Theodorin Gemma, Theodorin Gemma Biang is there, Theodorin. But then you get to the ports, for instance, the ports, right. then you have Gabriel's brother over there. Mm -hmm. You get to the Ministry, ministry of uh, Sports, then you have mm -hmm. Ruslan there. Then you get to Didi, who did uh, Carmelo, Carmelo Vono, who is in mm -hmm. Bata, who basically controls the military there. Mm -hmm. So, and then you get to, uh, I can't remember her name, Francisca something, you know, who runs Head Projectos. Head Projectos, so that's what I was going to tell you, yeah. Hey yeah, yeah, so you get to, so even those that do not have a ministerial position always have some, and head projectors actually, I mean, I'm, I suspect mm -hmm. you know about them. Mm -hmm. It is a very important institution, right? It is an important agency in, in Equatorial Guinea. They mm -hmm. monitor all the projects, all the infrastructural projects that's happening in the country and siphon millions and millions of dollars. You know, mm -hmm. this woman has become filthy rich, you know, with a lot yep. of her millions ended up in Portugal and other places, you know. So my point here, you know, is that even those that are not very visible have very powerful positions, in, or, yeah. or at least positions that allow them to illegitimately steal uh, money and self-enrich in a way that, you know, they shouldn't, only because they are the kids of the president. The president. Now, let me ask you this. People who often visit uh, Malabo, or some part of Equatorial Guinea, or some part of the new capital, Oyala, that was called Oyala. I don't know what name he's going to give to the capital now. I've seen a lot of new buildings, like social homes. Uh, there's one popular one uh, called Esperanza. Buena Esperanza. Buena Esperanza, Buena Esperanza. Yes. right. So um, how, I mean, people from outside, I mean, I've been there, but huh, I know a lot about it. But how does people understand how Obian operates in the sense that those homes are not distributed to the population. You know? Yeah. How, how, how does one explain that? I mean, yeah. his claims, he claims that they are built for the population, but those homes are not distributed to the population. Can you explain to my audience a little bit how it works there? Yeah. So one of the things, that, so this, as you mentioned, these were supposed to be social housing, you know, right. housing for the vulnerable, housing for people that, mm -hmm. housing for the people that live in Campo Yaounde, Yumbili, and Elangema, and those Elangema, places where right. you know there is right. no running water right. and stuff, right. right? But one of the things that you see right now, anecdotally, when you go and visit Buena Esperanza, is that in front of the many of these apartments, you have a Lamborghini, or you can see a Lexus, you can see cars 
that do not belong to people, they are poor. And they are poor, right. Yes, right. right. And that already tells you that, you know, okay, this housing is not poor people living there. Right. right? Uh, what happened in Ecuador, those houses were built, um, and immediately one of the first things that the government did was say, okay, if you need a house, come and put a down payment. Payment, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of uh, roughly fifteen thousand dollars, the equivalent right. of fifteen thousand dollars, because many of these were between thirty and forty-five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, the whole house, right? And I, I personally know many people, friends of mine, they went and put down the money, hoping mm-hmm. they'll get a house. Thinking they'll And still house, today, yeah. still yeah. today, they do not have a house. Wow. People that have a house are people that went. So the houses were then distributed among government officials, ministers, right. director, general uh, of this place, secretary of this place, those are the people that get houses. And those are the people that then sold those houses to other people, including people they had already put down a down payment in, by increasing the price, right? You know, so you do have some le- non-government officials living in those places, but that's because they bought those, pla- those houses from ministers and people. There are ministers like uh, Lucas, Lucas Ngema, who was right. at one point minister of uh, education, I believe. Right now he mm-hmm. doesn't have, I think right now he's just a senator or something, mm-hmm. who I was told had six of those houses. Yes. Right? I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. that, that, that some that, of them have eight houses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so this guy, you know, the person, one person was renting one of those houses, which is why he know that, you know, he had six. So there are people like that, you know, who you know, oh, had six houses, you know, and this you, you mentioned the people they had eight, you know. Oh, and this is crazy. So, so that's what was happening. And often, you know, you don't know who is behind it because, you know, you see this woman, this beautiful looking woman, there is the one that has these eight houses. But what you don't know, you know, that this young woman is the concubine, you know, is the wife of the wife of one of the ministers. So, yeah. So, yeah. Right. So let's let's talk about uh, solution. How do we solution? Uh, in other words, how do you, how do we get rid of a kleptocrat? So I wasn't I wasn't joking earlier, you know, when I said that you know we have to find ways to get to the enabler, right? The enablers, right and right. as you know, there are enablers. The enabling starts mm-hmm. from inside, right? Mm-hmm. Because take Theodorin. Theodorin is a very unsophisticated guy. Theodorin yeah. is not a smart guy. Theodorin cannot read and write, mm-hmm. right? So he needs someone right there that knows how to do the math and knows how to do. He the likes, He likes to talk over people. Exactly. Yeah, he likes to talk. You can't explain anything to him. He knows everything. He's always, yeah. he looks like our own president that we have here now. He talks, you tell him something, he always talk over you. you know? Yeah. So we, I mean, uh, here in the West, you know, we can talk about going after enablers. Right. The other thing that we need to be thinking about, though, is how do we get enablers, uh, enablers of the opposite, right? People, they enable us to fight against corruption, mm-hmm. whistleblowers. Yeah. How do you get people there inside that system that can tell you, okay, I work for Societe General and this is what is happening and I can send you documents, you know, and whether mm-hmm. they send it to you, the lawyer, whether they send it to the Ari Rombe, the thing, yeah. and, the yeah. thing then share it with you, yeah. that is getting us solving that problem. You know, we yeah. need whistleblowers, you know, yeah. in Africa. We need people, because uh, in Equatorial Guinea, for instance, you don't have uh, lawyers they mm-hmm. can declare, I am going to fight corruption over corruption. here. No way. And can take these cases, no <laughs> can take those cases to a judge in Equatorial Guinea. And that will never happen. I mean, exactly, that will never right? ever happen. It's exactly. not possible. Yeah, I don't know the situation in Cameroon, right? Mm-hmm. But I know, for instance, from my colleagues in Chad and Congo Brazza, that will mm-hmm. not happen there. You know, you will not find a lawyer in Brazzaville who brings a case against uh, Denis Asungueso and takes it to a judge in Brazzaville who, who accepts it. <laughs> in Cameroon, neither. In Cameroon, neither. Even though, even though in Cameroon you have where the president decides after getting hammered by some, when he wake up, I mean, when he wakes up and he feels like you are not doing what you're supposed to do, they will send you to jail because he has arrested a lot of his people. But some claim that he, he has arrested those who wants to run necessarily against yeah. him. Which I don't, I don't yeah. know if that's true. Because when you look at a guy, Honestly, I don't, I mean, I know he does a lot of bad things. You could judge, people could judge him all over, but I haven't been able to see the amount of properties that the guy has 
overseas. You know, all I know is that he has a private property in his village in Vomaka. But I don't know if he, if he has something else overseas. I heard about a clinic in Baden-Baden, but nobody has ever seen that. He goes mostly, as you mentioned in the report, uh, so eloquently uh, <laughs> that he likes to travel to Switzerland. Everybody knows that. I mean, this is public record. So me saying that here, I'm not yeah. jeopardizing anything. I'm not giving a secret. <laughs> Everybody knows that Bia likes to go to Switzerland and he likes to live and stay at the Intercontinental, right? Yeah. It's not a secret. So that's why I'm saying that based on that, I don't know him to have properties elsewhere. Maybe his kid, yeah. I don't know. But he himself is, is a guy, I mean, I don't know. He's, he's a strange person, but you know, that's gonna be the, the subject of another debate. <laughs> but tell, tell, tell us what solution can we, I mean, yeah. we created a couple of them. Yes. Uh, so we need, we need enablers. Yeah, well, I mean, those are out here in the West, you can't right. do that, right? But right. Uh, if you're inside the country, you know, you need to be blowing the whistle whenever you see something wrong right. happen, right? I think part of what uh, the challenge, uh, where the challenge lies, you know, is that some of us, we haven't, some of us, they're fighting corruption. Mm -hmm. We have not done the job of connecting the dots and letting people know that, you know, look, the fact that Theodorin can walk around in Malabo driving a Lamborghini and flashing his Michael Jackson glove is not good for Equatorial Guinea, it's not good for you. Right. The fact that he has that there, or the fact that he can go and reporters a car that's been auctioned off in mm -hmm. Geneva, uh, it means that later on when there is something like the coronavirus, mm -hmm. the country does not have the resources mm -hmm. to pay people in, in, in the medical profession mm -hmm. to take care of you. The country do not have the resources to buy enough ambulances so people from different places can come to the hospital because they are calling ambulance instead of trying to drive their own car. So you know, we have to connect, we have to make people see that you know corruption is not cool. The fact that you know you can drive, you can fly in a private jet, it doesn't make you cool when that money is stolen. From it's stolen, people. right? It's the money that this, I mean, belongs to the people who are suffering, who cannot go to the hospital. Well, I mean, I've seen situations in Malabo that were, that, I mean, they were so desperate. I mean, I cannot even tell you. Uh, it's, so it's, so uh, in, in that report, for instance, in a your call, I am describing the importance of um, a concerted effort to work along or to work together right. people in uh, investigative journalism, right. NGOs, uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. journalists, international organizations, we have to create those networks right. that collectively work to expose this type of corruption. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's what allowed us to do what, was, what we have been able to do in France, mm -hmm. is what allowed cases in many is other it, places, is, not just in Africa, right. all this over. Is, this is precisely why I came up with the project of Global Private Prosecution Project, because mm -hmm. the idea behind it is the possibility to have a private prosecution where uh, public prosecution cannot push. Because when you look at the case in France, where these organizations were able to prosecute Theodorin, mm -hmm. because they prosecuted Theodorin, what they call in French uh, a party civil, where yeah. you have the possibility to intervene. This is exactly why I decry the fact that private prosecution was abandoned here in the US. But it's still valid. We're going to be able to launch a campaign to seize the properties in Potomac, Obian, because under Maryland law, there is still a possibility to do some private prosecution if the Attorney General accepts. So what we need to do is to get together all of us activists and you know everybody that support the cause of fighting against these uh, 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 dictators to be able to push and motivate the Attorney General of Maryland, the state of Maryland, to seize those properties yeah. as proceeds of corruption so you you are getting at something that you know is very very important that yeah. we might not have time to discuss today but that's yeah. that's the the whole idea of working not just not we, we cannot think about this as in oh it's a problem for equatorial guinea let the equator guinea and see how they can go after that property in potomac right mm -hmm. it is important that we begin to understand those of us here in the u.s well, you're in uh, New York, I'm mm -hmm. in North Carolina, Those, there are many people in DC, Virginia, etc. Yeah. It is important for us to begin to see this as an African problem, and not particularly Equatorial Guinea. And the one reason I'm mentioning that, 
The house, Obiang has two houses in Potomac. Yep. And right next door is, is the, the house, house of yes. Yaya Jami. Yaya Jami. Yaya Jami is right now in, the, in Equatorial Guinea. Guinea. Yes. Right? Yeah. So here you have a situation where have we already had all the networks between Gambians and Equatorial Guineans and others working together to fight this. Right now, we should be going after Yaya. Yaya Jami no longer has head of state immunity. Mm -hmm. Obiang, Obiang, unfortunately, is still the president, still has head of state immunity, and it, may, it might still be difficult for us to persuade the authorities, the law enforcement authorities, attorney general and others in Maryland to go after those properties because they say, look, head of state immunity. But why aren't we working together to go after Yaya Jami? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think Adama Barrow and his people are going to do that. You know, so right. it should fall on us, right. lawyers, civil society, just the way they have enablers. Yes. We should be enabling the prosecution and the of asset recovery in those type of cases. Of course. Now, let me ask you this. Since we're talking about the asset recovery, that was going to be my next question to you. Um, mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the way the Department mm -hmm. of Justice handle the 30 million dollar proceed that came out of the sale of the mansion of mm -hmm. mr theodorin mm -hmm. uh the gangster yeah yeah because theodorin so, is a gangster yeah 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 unfortunately it does yeah. no, that's exactly gangster. what kleptocracy means no, he, right yeah, you know, a these are, these are, yeah he's a he's a gangster yeah so those of us that had worked closely uh, following pressing uh, Obiang and Theodorin, because as you might recall, uh, there was an investigation that led to discovering that you know seven hundred million dollars were at the Riggs banks in mm -hmm. uh, Dupont Circle in DC. Mm -hmm. So you know it's not just Theodorin who has yeah. laundered money here. Yeah. Uh, and those of us that were involved in all that corruption, all that money laundering that was happening here were very disappointed to see the Department of Justice in the United States settling a case that they could have taken to court and beat Theodorin. And right. instead of just acquiring uh, $30 million, acquiring more than that, right? right? And instead of you know reaching an agreement in which right now to spend 20 of the $30 million, you have to have Theodorin's consent you could have had a situation where the U.S. would have sole authority, sole decision on how to spend that money. Mm -hmm. But by going through settlement instead of through the case, the trial, yeah. we are where we are right now. Theodorin, for instance, one of the, one of the two of the uh, big things that get to me in this case is the fact that you know, this case was not just a mansion originally, but also mm -hmm. an airplane, a private jet, and a whole bunch of properties belonging to Theodore, well, the Theodore, Theodore right. bought from an auction belonging to Michael Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. Theodore then came and took that plane and took all those assets and flew them to Equatorial Guinea. And in fact, yeah. we had them on display at the cultural, no, the Equatorial Guinean Cultural Center right there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. there, the plane alone, the plane alone was $70 million. The plane yeah. alone. Yeah. We, we're not talking about 30 million, right? 30 million. So the plane alone was yeah. 70. The Michael Jackson stuff, the gloves, the jacket, the blah, all that stuff, I don't know how much they were worth. But say, here's a case where you could have gotten upwards of $100 million, $100 million and you're million. now dealing with just $30 million. Mm -hmm. Be that as it may, um, it is problematic to me that uh, you, know, you have to have Theodorin consent. Theodorin, Theodorin's father has been in power now for 40 years. Yep. Um, and all that time, their priority has not been developing anything in that state. No. And if now one of the preconditions to spending $20 million becomes having his consent, that only means that you're going to continue to run into a snag, into a block, into a wall. Yeah. Because Theodorin's priority, Theodorin, as you very well put it, is a gangster. His priority is not to see any of that money benefiting mm -hmm. anyone but himself in Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. So you are already starting either because you don't understand Theodorin or because, I don't know, you're persuaded by whatever Theodorin told you, starting with, uh, with a neg from a negative position. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. cannot spend that money with Theodorin's consent and still benefit people of Equatorial Guinea. That's, that's a, an exercise that is difficult to pull off in Equatorial Guinea. Um, then there is the 10 million, because it's 30. So there is mm -hmm. the 10 million that the U.S. has sole discretion in spending. Mm -hmm. And that is where, you know, we have been trying to push the U.S. So I would like to see the U.S. spend that money in supporting efforts that 
prevent that type of money laundering. You know, first of all, the violations they happen on the ground, you know, the 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 um, prerequisite crimes, you know, all the mm -hmm. fraud, all the extortion, all the mm -hmm. stealing that happens on there prevents that. So you want to see, okay, what, where are the organizations in the country, organizations in the diaspora mm -hmm. fighting to prevent corruption? Where are the organizations fighting to maintain the people informed? Where right. the media, where the investigative journalism? Right. And support those efforts, hoping that that stops corruption on the shores of that country Thank before you. they even come to, to the U.S. to launder that money. Mm -hmm. And so far, we haven't seen any of that money being spent. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, about the... Um, were, you, were you satisfied when the U.S. sent back the, the Abacha's funds to Nigeria? So there is a big difference, right? You know, right. where Abacha was no longer president. Abacha has not been president now for what, 20 something years, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, and in the interim between Abacha and when those monies started going, I believe it started going on the Jonathan, if I'm mm -hmm. not uh, mistaken here, mm -hmm. you have had at least four or maybe three presidents, mm -hmm. right, since Abacha. Mm -hmm. So there was a complete change of regime. And I'm not saying that, you know, by any means that everything was great and dandy and working in Nigeria. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, in Nigeria, you know, it's a fundamentally different uh, animal than Equatorial Guinea. In Nigeria, yeah. Yeah. you know, despite the challenges, uh, you have human rights activists and independent journalists and people working in Nigeria doing the type of work that you want to see people do in places like Equatorial mm -hmm. Guinea, Cameroon, Congo, Brazil, Gabon, and others, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different animal. Um, I have talked to members of the civil society uh, in Nigeria and a lot of them are happy that they were, a lot of them, first of all, feel that they were involved in the process mm -hmm. of discussions, both with the Swiss government, the UK government, but also with the World Bank, right? right. Many of them feel that, you know, the challenges come when they have to negotiate or when they have to talk with the Nigerian government, right? Okay. Um, so I don't think I am in a position to fully say yes, it has been done right or it's been done yeah. wrong. What yeah. I can say, however, is that you do have civil society in Nigeria. Many of them have been involved and many of them have been satisfied. Many of them, in fact, tell me that, you know, look, right now we know where the monies are going and from time to time we can go to the families they have received right. funds to see how they're doing. So there is monitoring going on. Right? Yeah. Um, has all the money been given out? No, you know, to my knowledge, you know, the UK is still holding on mm -hmm. to uh, millions. Uh, Switzerland is still holding on to millions. Many people think that, you know, involved in the World Bank, given the, the overhead that organizations like the World Bank or IMF mm -hmm. or the UNDP would, would demand, <coughs> might not be the best thing, that perhaps going directly through NGOs uh, is a better way. I think for those of us in Equatorial Guinea, or people in Congo Brazza, hopefully soon, these are problems that we would like to be able to be discussing rather than being in a position that we still are right yeah. now where US money has been taken and we don't know how they're being spent. Switzerland has taken about $21 million from selling or from auctioning off the cars. We yeah. don't know how they're being spent. France tends to gain between 100 and 150, depending on the values of some of the properties inside the yeah. house. And we don't know how that money is going to be spent. spent right. Brazil still has $16 million. $16 million today, dollars, right. And we don't know what they're doing with it. I mean, that is not a good position for right. citizens or for right. civil society to be in. Right. So in other words, what you're saying, what you're telling me or telling the audience is that you, you guys don't, I mean, we don't have any mechanism, right, to be able to monitor, to monitor where and how the money is, the money is being kept. I think that's something we need to focus on. You know, yes. from my yes. perspective, I think that's something we need to focus on to ask them accountability, at least to have knowledge that is being kept at so, so, and so, and is being, you know, we know the interest because when the government is going to change in the particular game, that is, for me, there's no doubt, it's going, it must change. Africa must change. We cannot keep having this kleptocrat running our countries, our motherland, our beautiful, beautiful and beautiful Africa. Is not possible. This is unsustainable. It cannot, I mean, for those of you who are watching this video, watching me and watching my brother, Alicante, talking, Tutu and I are talking. Listen, 
it's never too late to join the fight. Yeah. This is a fight worth to fight for, you know, yeah. because it is not, I mean, nobody else will come to Africa to fight this fight for us. This might not be for us today, but it might be for the generation, for our kids. So if you are in the diaspora, anywhere else in the world, Tutu just told you, we have mechanism here in the U.S. First of all, what people should know in Africa is that in the U.S., you can get compensated mm -hmm. for bringing out information concerning corruption mm -hmm. in your home country. In other words, mm -hmm. since this most corruption occur with foreign companies, because uh, we're not talking about the little corruption. We're talking about companies coming to invest in the country yeah. and corrupting our leaders, African yeah. leaders, in order to get access to market. If you bring that information here, the U.S. will use it and you will get compensated. The U.S. has paid more than, I don't know, $20 billion to whistleblowers. So it works, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> I'm sorry. So, um, Brother Tutu, I, I have to ask you um, right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you think um, after Obiang, because I, when I look at Equatorial Guinea, I look at that kleptocratic regime mm -hmm. and the way it uh, it operates. Sometimes mm -hmm. I even wonder how I was able to work for. A, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm grateful to God that God let me work for them from here. I was working at a mission, doing UN stuff, doing US stuff. So uh, I'm glad because but I was able to see to touch to the finger. I never helped them launder money. And I'm looking for that money right now. I'm, I have a case in court, in federal court against Obiang. Because I work for the country, they refuse to pay me. So we are in court for that. So um, I wonder, I'm wondering if you are going to run one day for, you know, uh, for the position of president in your country, because you deserve it. You've been fighting for so long. And I know you as a, as a good person, as somebody who has a good morality, who has uh, uh, a, a plan for its country. I can tell you, because Obiang has told me personally, that you are the most dangerous opponent that he fears in the US. You know, so I, no, I, I, it's not a comp I don't know if it's a compliment or mm -hmm. something else, but I know that for sure. I mean, I've, I've told you it, that. It's not a compliment. I can so, tell you it's not a compliment. <laughs> when, a, when a dictator, Known for their ruthlessness, uh, tells you they fear you. You know, it's never a compliment. Um, I think we have to focus on the fight that we have ahead of us, right? Yeah. You have right in front of us, and the fight we have some serious challenges right now. I mean, the coronavirus yeah. is uh, bringing to bear some of the underlying issues that we yeah. have in places like Equatorial Guinea, where there is no rule of law and there is no governance, no basic mm -hmm. governance, right? Um, when you don't, to give you an analogy that many, hopefully many of your audience uh, would understand, right? Mm -hmm. When you do not have a soccer pitch, right? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to play soccer again, right? Mm -hmm. If you live in a swamp, if you live in a swamp where there's only just water, you have to play water polo, you have to play something else. You cannot play mm -hmm. soccer. Right, mm -hmm. or if you're living on a grass, you know, then you don't swim. Right, right. you have to right. have the right environment. You have to have certain things that ensure that you know, yes, you can mount an organization, whether it's a political organization or whether it's just a campaign organization, however you want to call it, to get to the people to talk to them about the meaning of democracy, the meaning of our democratic participation, you know, the importance of voting, all the different things, yes. to educate their minds enough to where come elections, you become the president, if that's what your priority is. Mm -hmm. We do not have that basic infrastructure in Equatorial Guinea, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot run for president in, in uh, Somalia right now. You mm -hmm. cannot run for president in Equatorial Guinea. You have to have some basic infrastructure that does not exist. And that is the infrastructure that, you know, many of us are working to put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a combination of things that you have to do. You know, mm -hmm. one is going after these kleptocrats. 
uh, hopefully holding them so financially accountable in many different places to where they cannot govern. Whether because people realize in the country that they think, okay, we cannot have Theodorin replace his father, mm -hmm. or whether it's because the international community realize, okay, this is a gangster, we cannot accept this gangster to come to G8 meetings or to come to the US and introduce himself as the president of any country mm -hmm. where he cannot even communicate, right? Mm -hmm. Once you get to that position where you know completely delegitimize this presidency or whoever replaces him, whether it's Theodorin or Theodoro Biogo or anyone else, right. then you begin to say, okay, how do we get to a position where we can be taken seriously as a state instead of what we have right now, which is a failed state? Mm -hmm. Once you get a state, you know, once you get even just the same, once you get enough to say, okay, we have people that understand how to make laws and can rewrite the constitution, people that understand basically, you know, how the economy works and can use the contracts that we have right now with some of these multinational companies to ensure that enough revenues come into the country that these companies are paying their fair sharing taxes to help us rebuild the economy right now the fact that we're going to the imf for money and about five years ago we got two billion dollars from china mm -hmm. is because there's a serious mismanagement a serious problem of mismanagement, mismanagement. of the resources yeah. of the natural resources of the country right yeah. so how do we fix that you have to fix all that before you begin to worry about, okay, who can be a president? And that might require an interim, uh, a situation in which you have an interim panel of people running the country, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a president, but two, three people that say, okay, let's focus on building the institution of this country to where three years from now we can have elections. And I can assure you, and you're from Central Africa, I don't need to mm -hmm. tell you this, Equatorial Guinea, like Cameroon, like everywhere else, is full of politicians, most of them in the diaspora, waiting for the opportunity to come and become the next Obiang. Those guys... Not the not next Obiang, the next president. <laughs> the next hopefully, Obiang. They, hopefully uh, not the next Obiang. My brother, yes. my brother, yes. in order not to become the next Obiang, you have to be thinking about, no, seriously, in yeah. order not to become a next dictator, you have to be thinking about democracy seriously. Right. I do not know a single politician from Equatorial Guinea in diaspora right now mm -hmm. that's thinking about democratic inclusion seriously. They're right. thinking about rule of law seriously, right. Right? right? I mean, you talk to them and you realize, yeah. okay, this person, their first priority is going to become self-enrichment. How do I that's become right. as comfortable, you know, and so that's the, that's the reality that we have. Yeah. I'm not okay. saying this, we should be working against that for sure, yeah. for sure, but that's, that's, that's where we are right now, right? So, those guys, you know, the first guys that, you know, are going to say, okay, I've been here for the last four decades waiting for my opportunity. Tutu is not going to come from the U.S. He hasn't even lived in Equatorial Guinea for the last three decades. He's not going to come over here and tell us what to do. So I, I'm not interested in fighting them for anything that they feel that, you know, they have a, a right to. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm interested in, uh, however, you know, is building, rebuilding this country. We need right. a state. We need a country that uh, can go outside and be taken seriously, can be right. inside and be taken seriously, can negotiate on par with oil companies, mm -hmm. can take care of its people when you hit a, a situation like what we have right now, the mm -hmm. COVID-19 pandemia, pandemic. Yes. Right. Well, Brother Tutu, uh, Alicante, it was uh, a great conversation that we had, and we are going to have uh, more conversation like this one uh, to further the development of Africa, to eliminate mm -hmm. kleptocrats from our continent, and to make our continent to, uh, to be brilliant as it's supposed to. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for accepting to take, care, uh, to take part of this conversation, okay? Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.